welcome to Hilltop Baptist Church, the 23rd of August, a very hot Sunday. I hope that you have air conditioning at your home. And thank you for joining us on our live stream. Thank you for being part of our services today. Uh, we want to start off this morning with a song. So join us as we sing Mighty to Save, Mighty to Save. moment uh, about cancer that she's facing, but uh, I was a blessing to baptize those four. And then uh, we heard Sunday last week that Donna Fletcher had received Christ into her heart. And also in our Bible study on Monday morning, um, uh, David uh, told me that his girlfriend that lives in Vegas had received Christ as well. So it was a blessing to have two saved and four baptized, and we're thankful for that. Um, Dwight said that he had no skin cancer, so that's an answer to prayer. And Liz said that hers is not cancer either. Uh, Oren is at home. Damien had a really good second interview, and uh, we're still having good numbers on Wednesday night. Now we want to talk about a prayer request. So um, if you'll pray for Carolyn with cancer, if you'll pray for uh, Larry and Betsy and Carmen, and Tanya, and Ziggy, and um, uh, there's a couple of others for Bob with cancer. Pray for Michi's friend with COVID-19, as well as a family that recently lost someone uh, that passed away. Um, we also want to pray for Yvonne. She was supposed to have her surgery, but she fell and bumped her head pretty seriously, and so uh, her, can her surgery was put off. So if you'll pray for them, pray for the Bradshaw family, pray for um, Harry and Philip and Samantha and others for salvation. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer this morning for these requests. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for answered prayer. We thank you that you've been doing great things in people's lives. It was great, Lord, to hear of these two that accepted Christ. It was good to hear to have these four that came for baptism. Lord, it was a blessing that Dwight does not have any cancer, and that Liz did not have any cancer. Uh, we're praying for Oren, and he might feel better at home. And we thank you for Damien's second interview. Lord, we do want to uh, thank you as well for the fact that we can be outside and have church together in your name. Lord, we come praying for these requests today. We pray for these with cancer, for Carolyn, and for Larry, and Betsy, and Carmen, and Tanya, uh, we pray for Ziggy and for Bob. We pray as well for Don and for Lou and for Virginia and Nona and for Florence. We pray, Lord, for uh, the unspoken request for Andrew and Tina and Dan and Marilyn. We pray also for spiritual needs, Lord, today. Uh, we pray for uh, the lost, for Liz's family, for Peggy and Blanca and for Kathy, and for Harry, and Philip, and Samantha. And we pray today, Lord, that you might have your hand upon Damien. 
uh, as he's in the hospital with blood clots in his lungs, that you might help him. Uh, the doctors and the physicians and the specialists will be able to take care of things so that he uh, can get out soon, Lord, and that the blood clots will go away and that they can know what, what's causing this and that he'll be well and doing much better. We're thankful that you took care of him and protected him at this time and did not allow things to be any worse. Thank you for your, your protection, Lord. Uh, we pray for those that are fighting fires around our state, that you might be with those and those that have been uh, dislocated because of the fire, they've had to evacuate, that you might be with them and you might strengthen them and help them. Uh, we pray for our leadership in our county, in our state, in our nation, as they make decisions regarding uh, COVID-19 restrictions, whether or not we can be back in church. Lord, we pray for the gospel. We know that it cannot be stopped no matter what or who says that you need to stop it. The gospel will go on. The church will go on. You said that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And so we pray that you might keep, uh, help us to keep our eyes on you at this time to know that you're taking care of us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, do we have a song now? Okay. Well, we can sing Amazing Grace together. So join me in singing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's grace than when we'd first begun. All right, my talented team, do we have a song now? All right. Well, we had music, I promise you. Uh, maybe we'll double up on them next week. I don't know. But we were going to sing, ten, I think it was 10,000 Reasons or Mighty to Save and Shout to the Lord. So look them up on YouTube and sing along with them, but just not during my message, okay? So we're going to continue to talk about the last days. We're going to continue today to talk about the last days. So uh, we're in the book of 1 Thessalonians today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Now let me give you a little background on this before we read this. In chapter 4, these words are said, starting in verse number 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep that we sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so those who are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So Paul says these words, and then he goes into chapter 5, and again, remember, 
In the Bible, the verse and chapter divisions were placed later. And so the things that we're going to see would have been read immediately after Paul gets through with saying that we should comfort one another with these words. And he goes into about the return of Jesus Christ. And he tells the early Christians that they should be watching, that it's going to happen, that it will come like a thief in the night. And so we read these verses and we're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 1. It says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Now we found out last week as he was writing in 2 Thessalonians, uh, and this has also been seen in Peter, that some of the early Christians were a little confused. This is just within 40 years of, of Jesus ascending up into heaven, 50 years and they're saying, well, maybe he's already come back. And so we saw last week that uh, Paul said that unless there come a falling away of first and the man of sin revealed that the son of man would not return. And so we should know these things. We should have a grasp on these things. We should have these things in our heart so that we're not afraid. Sometimes when I'm reading a book. I like to read fictional books. I like to read autobiographies or biographies. Uh, I like to read historical books. And sometimes as I'm reading, um, the story is full of twists and turns, and, and I get tired of reading it. It's got like four different storylines going on. And so I simply take time, and I just go to the end of the book because I want to find out who did it. You say, well, that's cheating. Well, I might go back and read the rest of the book, but sometimes I just get... And it's not Dr. Seuss books that I'm familiar with in reading. I've read enough of them to my daughters growing up. Uh, I could probably quote you some of them uh, from there. I could probably tell you the whole foot book from Dr. Seuss. I could probably just say the whole thing. I read it so many times to Katie and to Ruth and to Kelly. But I'm talking novels. To read to the end... And, and, or to skip to the end to find out who wins or who, who ends this thing. So um, now with the Bible, it's okay to read to the end and find out at the end. Because you know, as we as believers, if we know, if we're aware, then things that are happening don't get us running around like Henny Penny. Don't get us around running around like some of these others that are saying, the world is coming to an end. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. I have every confidence that God will take care of everything, that he's fully in charge. His hand is on the planet still. And you say, well, why this and why that and why this and why that? But if you have your life in Jesus Christ, you are not worried about what's going to happen next. Because the Bible tells us exactly what's going to happen next that Jesus is going to return. And he's not coming back as a baby in a manger. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He'll be on a white horse and he'll come and he'll land and he'll slay the armies of the world that go up to fight against him by speaking his, the words of his mouth. And then he will land on the Mount of Olives. He'll walk through the eastern gate into the temple where he'll set up his thousand year kingdom where the earth will return to the state it was in as it was in the garden of eden satan will be locked away for a thousand years and this earth will we will see what happens on the earth when god's in charge when god's in full control and so that's going to happen that's exciting to think about that happening but paul said you should know these things Concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. I don't need to say this. So now as we look into chapter 5, we're going to see three things. The first thing that we're going to see is the day of the Lord will happen suddenly and unexpectedly. The day of the Lord will happen suddenly and unexpectedly. Now we're told in another passage that it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Not a wink, but a twinkle. It's just milliseconds. That it's just going to happen. 1 Thessalonians 5 2. 
For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. We are not in a world where thieves email you, send something through the snail mail, call your house, push your doorbell, and say, um, we're going to be working your neighborhood in about a week, and uh, we just like to come and check off when you're going to go to sleep, and what time your house is going, what time your dogs go to sleep, or what's your dog's favorite food, and and so we'll be around in about two weeks from today, and uh, just have all your uh, your personal belongings and your wealthy things, your your gold and your money and everything, your electronics. Just have them sitting out in the open, and it'll make it easier for us when we come in to steal from you. A thief doesn't do that. A thief comes when you least expect it, and it will come suddenly. Remember a few years ago here at the church, we had the Met trailers. The Met trailers are party trailers that are used by the association here in San Diego. They have everything you need for a block party. And we were having them parked here because we have a lot of parking area. And uh, we came and found that somebody had taken time and had broken into each one of those trailers and had taken everything of value out of those trailers. And they were pretty bold about it. They were over here by the side gate in fuel view of the cameras, um, which we don't, we didn't respond quickly enough. We have an updated alarm system now. But it, it didn't seem to phase them that there were cameras there. They were loading up at six o'clock in the morning. And then another time they took everything out and they threw it over the fence into a empty yard back there they could go through the park and take it out we we did not expect them to come if we if we knew if they'd sent us a flyer now coming to your neighborhood next tuesday at five o'clock we'll be here to rob you then we would have been expecting them but no the thief comes unexpectedly and jesus says this a couple of times in his in the gospels talking about coming as a thief in the night. It's going to come unexpectedly and suddenly. Matthew 24, verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 42. We'll spend a little bit of time here in Matthew. Uh, if you want to mark it in your Bible and hold your place there, uh, we'll go back to 1 Thessalonians 5 in a minute, and we'll return to Matthew 24 in a minute as well. But it says in verses 42 and 44, Watch therefore... For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Suddenly and unexpectedly to this world. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. We're going to the next chapter in Matthew 25 and, and verse number 13. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, those are words to the disciples, and those are words to us. But Jesus is coming unexpect well, <laughs> unexpectedly to the world, because I'll tell you what, I'm always watching the skies. I'm always waiting and listening for the trumpet sound. I'm always ready for the return of Jesus Christ. When you say, well, do you sleep? <laughs> yeah, I sleep. But I should be ready because it's coming suddenly and unexpectedly like a thief in the night. We, as believers, have to be ready. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But when a thief comes, he doesn't make the announcement. He doesn't say, I'll be here at such and such a time. He doesn't say, well, expect me, I'll be there, and this is when I expect you to have everything out and ready. That's not how it works. The thing that we need to see next in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is the day of the Lord will occur when mankind feels that they have peace and and safety. The day of the Lord will occur when mankind feels they have peace and safety. Now that's not talking about you or I. 
That's talking about people that are not believers in Jesus Christ. For a long time in our society, Christianity, according to the people that don't believe in God, Christianity is the thorn in the flesh of the common folk or of the higher education. They say that we're backward if we believe the Bible. They say if we believe the Bible to be true, that, that you know, basically we're a fringe of society that doesn't have any place in reality. And they would like to shut us up. They would like us to not protest abortion and not uh, protest injustice. They would like us to not stand for the orphans and the widows. They would like us to just be quiet and go away. Since the 1950s in America, Christianity has had less and less of influence in the public arena. There were a couple of Supreme Court cases, Madeline Murray O'Hare brought, stating that prayer should not belong in school. She was very much of an atheist, although I find it very ironic that her son that was raised in school, that she went to the Supreme Court about no more Bible reading in school, her son became an evangelist. He was saved and became an evangelist for a while. I haven't read any information on him recently. But from the about the 1950s, we started removing Christianity from the public arena. It, it was fine to have it inside a church. But we didn't want to have it out in the public arena. Uh, we don't want to have Bible reading in school. I, I'll tell you this. I, I, I've, I've known teachers that did nothing more than have the Bible sitting on their desk. They didn't have it open. They might read it between classes. But it was just sitting on their desk. And they got in trouble because it was sitting on their desk. Now, you might say, well, they removed prayer from school too. And there used to be public prayer in school, and sometimes they pray before football games or they pray before other sporting events or other things. But for the most part, the only ones that are doing prayer in school are the teachers that they might have the help they need to make it through the day and the students that God might help them to remember what's going to be on the test. But it's, it's been moved from the public arena. Courtrooms have had the Ten Commandments taken down many uh, courtrooms back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s had quite predominantly displayed the Ten Commandments because our country was built based on the Judeo-Christian moral ethics. And so they would have the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. And so uh, they began to take them out because they said, well, people were offended because when they saw that, they felt guilty. Well, God's moral standards are God's moral standards. And they're a universal overarching stand. It should always be wrong to commit murder. Always. But that's been removed from the public arena. And they've tried to put us in a little box. And so far we have freedom of speech. But in some countries around the world, they don't want you to talk about Christianity or they don't want you to mention certain aspects about the Bible because this society is wanting to remove Christianity's influence. That's because they want to have peace and safety. They don't want to feel guilty. We're teaching evolution in our schools and evolution has no place for God. So if you get God out of the picture, you don't feel guilty about not doing what God tells you to do or doing what God tells you not to do. But mankind is going to think that they have peace and safety when he returns. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In verse number 3, when they say, peace and safety. Now, we've got the Christians all sort of quieted down, and, and things are going well, the world is doing well. We, and you might say, well, apparently it's not right now, but there's a lot of things happening. Now, we talked about the man of sin last Sunday and how he's going to step forward and sort of settle everything down, put some oil in the water and, and make it smooth out. 
But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So they're going to say, oh, everything's fine. We've got it made. We got the Christians in their little box, and they're being quiet, and they're not causing disruptions and problems, and they're not running around telling us we need to live a certain way, and everything's good. We got it. Everything's at peace. Sudden destruction will come upon them. I'd like to go back to Matthew chapter 24. This is talking about the return of God. And Jesus makes some interesting statements. And it parallels with 1 Thessalonians 5, where it talks about living in peace and safety. But what does it say? But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, we can go back and look at Genesis chapter 6 and see what it was like in the days of Noah. Uh, God looked upon the earth and saw that wickedness was in man's heart continually. And the only spiritual people that he could find were Noah and his family. And God said, I will not wrestle with man anymore. I'll give him about 120 years. And so Noah had time to build the ark. And it was a very large ark. He built the ark, and we think that he had used that time to try to reach the communities around him. He tried to reach people and, and get people to live correctly. But they paid no attention to Noah. We've got it made. Everything's okay. We're fine. We don't need God. We're great. It says there in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 41, As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Oh, <laughs> you remember there was, it's sort of become a joke that some guy with, a crazy look on his face and long hair and a long beard and he's wearing a sign on the front that says repent the end is near and he's walking through the community and trying to get people to understand that the end is coming and it's become a joke and so when we as believers start saying hey it's getting soon Jesus Christ is coming back everybody's like who's Jesus Christ oh you're, you're talking about that make-believe God that you guys use as a crutch? Psh, that's not who's coming back. We've got to do this and we've got to do that. And they're not concerned. We try to warn them what the Bible has to say about their need for salvation, about how people are sinners and they need Jesus Christ, and people don't want to hear it. People don't like to hear that. And so things are said and back and forth, and they're just living life. Live in life, we don't care. Jesus went on to say, two men will be in the field because they're just working. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left because it's going to be a sudden thing when they least expect it, when they think they're safe and peace is upon them. His return will come. Look in Luke. Luke 17, this parallels Matthew 24, but it gives us a little bit more detail. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. When he returns, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. If you read in Genesis about the story about God coming and meeting with Abraham and sending two angels down into Sodom to warn Lot and to tell him and his family to escape the city. 
and Abraham spends some time talking to God and saying, what if there's 50 righteous? Will you save the city? Well, maybe 40 or 30 or 20. And he finally gets down. If there's 10 righteous people, will you destroy the city? And there wasn't 10 righteous people there. And it says the angels took a hold of Lot and his wife and his two daughters, and they left town. And as they were leaving town, they said, don't turn around and look because God was raining destruction, fire and brimstone from heaven. Brimstone has a burning sulfurous smell on that area. We think that that might be part of the Dead Sea where this city of Sodom and Gomorrah were at. But the people that lived there, everything was fine. Everything was going great. Lot, come out of there. I'm going to destroy it because they're not paying attention to me. They're not listening to me. I'm going to bring judgment upon them. Right now, everybody in America, I think, and even around the world, there are a lot of people that think everything is going to be okay. We'll just get the right leader. We'll get the right government. We'll have the right funding. We'll have the right things to do. Everybody will, you know, will be, sickness will be eradicated until the next COVID comes along. Peace and safety, but then the return will happen. Wow. The day of the Lord should not come as a surprise to the believer. That's what he said back there in 1 Thessalonians, the first verse. He said, don't be surprised. You have no need that I write to you about these things. Because you have a believe as a believer have the ability to know what the word of God says. God was gracious and merciful enough to say, here's what's going to happen at the end. If you believe the Bible, then you've got to believe what he says about what's going to happen at the end. So it, when I read ahead to the end of the story, I know that God wins. That's just the bottom line. That's what I have the faith about. It doesn't, it's not going to come as a surprise. Now, I can remember, and I heard my mom talk about this, because she was told, she, it was said, um, there are certain places that you might not want to be when Jesus comes back. Uh, you, some of you might remember that for the longest time, if you were a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, you were asked not to go to the movie theater because you might see things there that you shouldn't see or you might even be involved in doing something there that you shouldn't do. And then we have this directly into our house through the internet and through cable TV or satellite TV. So it's just like we're in the movie theater. In fact, we can watch something that we wouldn't have watched in the movie theater. We can watch it in the confines of our own home. And so I'll say this to you. Maybe there's some things that you don't want to be caught doing when Jesus returns. That you know are wrong. That you shouldn't be involved with when Jesus returns. It's going to come quickly. But it, it's, it shouldn't be as a surprise. And you shouldn't be saying, oh, everything's okay, I got it made. Because Pastor Walt said, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. I've already told you that back in 1988, there was a man that released a book. 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. He did a revised version the next year. 89 reasons why Jesus is coming in 89. As far as I know, he didn't publish one that said 90 reasons why Jesus is coming in 90 or 91 reasons why Jesus is coming in 91. Uh, there have been those that have talked about a certain year cycle, that there's several blood moons and, and all these things. And we can, you know, Jesus said, no man knows the day nor hour but we should be awake and aware. Let's read what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 through 6. But you, brethren and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. When it says sleep, it means we're not paying attention. You should be reading the Bible. You should be studying it. 
You should be examining what's going on in the world around us and say, I see signs of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We should be paying attention. We shouldn't be caught wanting. Because we do not know when Jesus will return. We are of the, we are of the day. We're not of night or darkness. We shouldn't be confused. One of the reasons that we have an alarm system here at the church is because, believe it or not, we have had thieves break in and steal. And so now we have some preparations. If they break in and steal, it will tell us that somebody's here so that we can deal with it. We had an individual come and the custodians were in the building and he saw that car and he thought maybe I was here and he could get some food or something. This was late at night. I don't know why he thought I was here. But he was frustrated because he banged on the doors and nobody would let him in. And finally, he threw a rock through the double doors. You might remember that the cross on the one side was boarded up for a long time. He threw a big rock through that and tried to come inside. Police were called and responded. We didn't know that he would do that, but we have things that we can see and watch through cameras and we have the alarm system so that we're not surprised if a thief decides to come back here to the church. Now again, the thief is not going to announce when he comes, but that doesn't mean we're not prepared. Maybe you have an alarm system at your place of employment or you have an alarm system at your home where at a certain time you push a button and any doors or windows are open, the alarm goes off while you're safe in bed. It's to keep us prepared because we're ready. And folks, we should be ready. Don't be sleeping and not paying attention. You should be watching and waiting. Signs of the times are everywhere that Jesus' return is imminent. Let's go to Mark chapter 13. Mark 13 says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. But we can be ready. The Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Jesus said, God said to them, I need you to do something. I need you to take a lamb and you're going to take its blood. You're going to put it on the doorpost of your house and over the lintel. You're going to roast the meat and you're going to get unleavened bread and you're going to get dressed and you're going to be ready to go because I'm going to deliver you tonight. And he sent the death angel who killed all the firstborn in Egypt, except for those that put the blood on the door. God said, be ready to go. Don't put any leaven in your bread. You won't have time for it to rise. Uh, kill the animal and have the meat. Have everything ready to go because you're leaving. We should be ready to go. To continue on in Mark 13, it says, It is like a man, the return of God, of Jesus. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Growing up, there came to be a point that my mom and dad said, Walton, you're old enough to show responsibility. We don't think that you'll harm your brother who's five years younger than me. So we'll let you and Robert stay home while we go and do something. And my dad was not a harsh taskmaster, but he was a taskmaster. In our backyard, we had two giant trees that we loved to get up in and climb in and have a tree house. And, and we played in the shade in the backyard. We had the best backyard in America. Well, it didn't have a pool, but who needs that? We would play and play, but one of the problems with having two gigantic trees is you have piles of leaves. And so my dad might say, now boys, 
your mother and I are going to go, we're going to make some visits and we might stop and get something to eat and we'll be gone. We'll be back maybe three o'clock, four o'clock. We would like you to pick up the leaves in the backyard. My brother and I, well, he was following my lead, so, and I tend to be a procrastinator. I've had to fight it for years. I tend to wait to the last minute, but, you know, they'd leave the house at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we knew they were coming back at 3 or 4 o'clock because mom was going to make dinner. And so what would we do? We'd go right out and get the rake and the bags and pick up those leaves and have them done by 1030 so we could enjoy the rest of our day. Absolutely not. Do you think we were stupid? We can get that done in half an hour. We'll wait until 2.30. So we'll do what we want to do. We'll climb and play in the treehouse, or we'll do this, or we'll do that, and, and we'll mess around in about 2.30. We'll get the rakes, and we'll just fly and make it happen. Guess who sometimes was in the backyard with a rake in his hand, raking leaves, when dad walked out the back door of the house. He told me he wanted it done by the time he got back. We also had two very large hedges that were over our heads. We'd have to climb a ladder to clip them, and then we'd have to do that about once a month. We'd have to clip that and clean all that up. He might give us that task, or the task might be, boys, clean up your room. We didn't have to wash our clothes, but we had to at least put them in a dirty clothes pile and put away our clean clothes and clean up our room, put our toys and things away. Uh, how many times I was caught because they appeared before I expected them. I don't know if you've ever been in that spot. I don't want to be there as a believer when Jesus comes back. I don't want to be putting off. You know what? I'll talk to my neighbor about Jesus Christ, but I'll wait a while. What happens if Jesus comes back tomorrow and you haven't talked? You haven't shared with him the gospel. You haven't shared with him how God changed your life or your family, your father, your mother, your children, your siblings. If you talk to them about Jesus Christ, well, I'll do it at Thanksgiving. Something will come up. I'll do it at, at Christmas. I'll try to get him to come to the Christmas Eve service. Something will come up. If we don't do, if we don't make things right with God, oh, I'll take care of that later. I've got plenty of time. We have folks in our church that are 90 years old. But for every 90-year-old in our church, there are probably 20 or 30 people who died at a much younger age. And so you can't look at it that way. And I, I know that we've been saying for many years, I heard it as a child when I was young, when I was messing around and not doing what I was supposed to do, that Jesus was coming back. Folks, that's now back far past. That's 50 years down the road. Jesus is coming back. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Uh, back in Matthew, we won't go there, but it talks about the women that were waiting for the wedding and some had their lights all filled with oil and some of them didn't. They weren't ready. Are you ready for his return? Are you lined up with what God wants you to be doing? Are you, have you done what God has told you to do? What I say to you, I say to all, watch. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. These are words of Jesus to the church. And he says this to them, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. You've gotten it. Hold fast and repent. Do the right thing. And therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Jesus' return is soon. All theologians that have looked at Bible prophecy have said, it's creeping closer. I mentioned this the other day, just as the, the minute hand on our clock is getting close to noon now, it's 15 minutes till, there's a doomsday clock that scientists and physicists have put together talking about how close the world is to nuclear annihilation. And I can remember hearing about that when I was a kid, and they'd say, well, the little hand is close to the 12, and the big hand is on the 11, or on, uh, on the 
1157, three minutes till midnight. And when that gets to midnight is when annihilation is supposed to come. Folks, just as this morning our minute hand is now at 14 or 13 before 12, I think that that's how close we are to the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to say 14 years. I'm not going to say 10 days. I don't know. But we need to be ready. He gives us the word of God so we can know these things. He gives us the word of God so we won't be afraid. Are you afraid of the end times? Are you afraid of what's going to happen? You've read Revelation and you say, that's scary. Unless you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then it's not scary. Many years ago, there was a movie that was on, and I forget who all was in it. I think Demi Moore might have been in it. And, and it was talking about the rapture and how this angel was coming in it. And I think, guess it represented Jesus Christ. And he was supposed to be doing things to start the tribulation unless there was another baby born. And so it was sort of a race to see if this baby would be born. Folks, Hollywood always has the answers, don't they? Somebody will make up a screenplay and say, this is how we're going to fix the problem. Or a politician will say, this is how we're going to fix the problem. Or an athlete, this is how we're going to fix the problem. The only one that's going to fix the problem is Jesus Christ. And it's not stoppable. It can't be stopped. So therefore, I need to be in the Word. I need to be studying the Word. How well do you know the Word of God? How well do you know God by praying and spending time in prayer and listening to him, listening to the Holy Spirit? Because this will help you to be strong in your faith and endure to the end. Because that's what we need. That's what we need. Jesus is coming soon. Maybe morning, night, or noon. Could be any time. Are you ready? This morning, dear believer, if you know Jesus Christ, are you prepared? Are you standing on the rock of your salvation, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and say, I'm not worried about COVID-19, I'm not worried about fires, I'm not worried about famine, I'm not worried about pestilence, because God's in charge, and everything is going to go the way exactly that he said it's going to go. Do you have that confidence today, dear believer? That it's in God's hands? I have absolute conf every confidence that it's going to go exactly as God has said in the Word of God. Now, if you're not a believer, or if you are a believer and you're struggling with fear, let's start with that first. If you're a believer and you're struggling with fear, then I want to pray for you today that you will not have any more fear about the end times, that you allow that to be placed in God's hands. Whatever happens, happens. Your salvation is secure. Your eternity is set. I want to pray for you that you won't be fearful. Or maybe you need as a believer to awake, to know that his return is soon. It's not 20 years down the road. Well, Pastor Walt, my dad used to say that Jesus was coming when I was a kid, and that was 50 years ago, and Jesus still hasn't come. Maybe it'll be another 50 years. Well, live like he's coming tomorrow. Live like he's coming tomorrow. If you don't know Jesus Christ, but I want to pray for you that you can find Jesus Christ. Salvation is simply admitting that you've broken God's laws, that you're a sinner. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Also believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, to pay the penalty. Confessing your sins and, believe, and confessing that he is Lord and Savior and inviting him into your life. That's all salvation is. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and come into my life. Come into my heart. Make me new. I believe that you died on the cross for me. Please forgive me. That's all you need to say for salvation. You don't have to be a Baptist. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to attend this church. You just need to believe that Jesus Christ is is the Savior. Make a heart commitment. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today thanking you 
for your words that you give us so that we might be prepared, we might be awake. We might not be like those that say peace and safety because sudden destruction is going to come and they won't expect it. But Lord, we are believers. We have the word of God and we know and we can see how closely we're, we are, how close we are to the return of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to stand firm in our conviction and knowing that everything is okay because you're still in charge. There's anybody that's struggling as a believer today and they're afraid that, Lord, that, hey, God's in charge. God's got this. I read the end of the book and we win. We win because he wins. Lord, I pray that you'll encourage those that are struggling. Lord, convict those believers that maybe are living as if your return is not imminent, that they might change their lives and get in the right place. Lord, if there's anybody that's been watching this live stream this morning that has not trusted in you, has not admitted they're a sinner and believed in you and confessed that you're the Savior and invited you into their lives, Lord, I pray that you might help them to do so today. Their life might be changed. We thank you for some that have recently opened up their hearts to salvation. We pray for others, our family members, our friends, our parents, our children, our siblings, our neighbors, our fellow workers, that they might come to salvation as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being part of our services today. Sorry we didn't have the music again. If you have a chance, go onto YouTube and look up um, Mighty to Save because He is Mighty to Save. Look up Shout to the Lord and watch those and partake in our service that way, if you will. We'll find out what the glitch is. Um, we appreciate and love Damien. Uh, you might have heard me mention in prayer that Damien is currently in the hospital uh, in ICU with blood clots in his lungs. Hopefully, he'll be able to break those loose so that he can be well and be home again. Pray as the doctors do everything they are doing to help him with that. But usually he's able to help fix these things so that we don't have a glitch. But it does happen. It does happen. Uh, we've had it when people were here in the building, <laughs> when things suddenly quit working. Uh, so uh, these things happen. But we can continue to rejoice in the Lord. So please let me know your prayer requests or your praise. Uh, sometimes I don't know what to put down on the prayer sheet because nobody said anything. So please let me know, either by calling the office and leave a message or send it to the church webpage or just send me an email. If you have my phone number, text me. Let me know what your prayer request is. We have several that are on our list right now that we've been praying for. Also, uh, we want to remind you to give. So far, the Lord is blessing us, so you can either send it through the mail. Uh, I will tell you this, if you want to stop by here and nobody's here, drop it in the mailbox. Drop it in the mailbox and it'll be safe there and I can take care of it from that point. Or you can give online through Tithely. That's our church webpage. Uh, check out hilltopbc.com and look for the green button that says give. Thank you for being in our services with us today and watching and worshiping with us. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. We should be watching for his return. Because it's soon and very soon. There was a song that you used to sing. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. And it's got like a hundred verses, so I won't sing them all for you this morning. But thank you for being part of our service. Let's bow our heads one more time in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day. Thank you for the word of God and what it contains and how it can give us hope for the future. Help us to be awake for your return, to be watching as you come as a thief in the night. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.